everybody. Welcome to the Pitchwise NFL Show. I'm your host, Rachel Von Oranje, and I am joined by my lovely, lovely, lovely co-host, Jeff Reinbold. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm awesome, girl. How are you? You're repping those Toronto, you're repping those Toronto Raptors today, huh? I'm repping the Raptors. And uh, as, as some of you may know, I am from Houston, so I'm actually a Rockets fan. But the Toronto Raptors have won me a lot of money starting last year when I picked them before the season to represent the East in the Eastern Conference Finals. So I'm like, you know what? That's my number two team. That's my adopted team. So uh, we the North. All right. We the North. What's your so basketball if I, team? If I'm ever playing basketball games, I'm going to call you for all my, my line. You should. You should. I got you. I, uh, I did really good last night, actually. I posted my picks. I did a two-game parlay. I hit the over in the uh, Denver Lakers game. And I also, uh, what was my parlay? And then I coupled it with, oh, uh, Denver plus six. So there you go. $50 won me 130 Boom. Hey, we're hot on those parlays, girl. We knocked our parlay out last week, too. We sure did. We sure did. And we're going to get into that when we talk about week three NFL season. But, gosh, week two, Jeff, brutal week for injuries. Brutal week for injuries. And uh, But I guess we're going to talk about my Falcons first. That's what the producers want us to do. We're going to talk about my Falcons. They want to bring up things that I have tried all week to for- desperately to forget. Um, my Fal- Look. Sunday is supposed to be the Sabbath, okay? Down here in the South, that is the Lord's Day. And there was nothing heavenly about last Sunday with my Falcons when they went to Dallas to take on the Cowboys. It was great. The first half of the game was great. The second half of the game, what do the Falcons do? They love to blow leads. It's just in Dan Quinn's DNA, it seems like. It's 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 mind-boggling, to be honest with you. They had a 20-point lead. They blew it. But what I want to talk to you about, Jeff, you're a special teams coach in the Canadian Football League, okay? So I figured when you saw the end of that game, I bet it made you throw up, okay? How are the Falcons so good at converting onside kicks, but whenever it came to defending one, they didn't even look like they knew their rules. They could have jumped on that ball, correct? Yes, absolutely. Now, you know what? i tell you what, Rachel, it's a little bit right now in the National Football League, every week is adventures in the kicking game because the week before we saw – how Tampa Bay misplayed a couple special teams plays really badly. And part of that is what we're, you know, we continually talk about, and it's just the facts. So it's it's what we got to talk about. When you don't have preseason games and you have as short a preseason as these guys have had, and no off-season programs, no coaching sessions, no OTAs, no no mini camps, any of those things, you can't cover every situation now. Those guys obviously did not know the rules and weren't situationally aware. And that comes down to coaching in the end. And, you know, those are June Jones, who's a good friend of mine, called me after the game and said, you know, that's the kind of play that gets you fired. And it really does, because you can't blow one like that at such a critical point in the game and and just sit there and watch the ball spin around until it goes 10 yards and then watch the opponent fall on. It was unbelievable play. It was unbelievable. And June Jones, I'm, I am I like that you know him. You guys are good buddies. I used to cover the Houston Roughnecks for the XFL here in Houston. Like, I was on the sidelines. I was interviewing June all the time. That is a Houston legend. He's an awesome guy. But if people don't know, he coached the Atlanta Falcons for a while as well. So uh, that's really cool, though. It's a small world in the coaching world, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, you know, I've known June since he was the head coach of the Falcons. But before that, he uh, – and another good friend of mine, Jerry Glanville, were in Houston together with the Oilers back in the back in the uh, House of Pain days in the Astrodome. Oh wow! I love the Astrodome. It it looks like a uh, looks like Armageddon now. Basically, <laughs> it's rat infested. In fact, I've I've been told that media members have to sign a waiver to walk into it now. Clouds actually form in the dome, and it actually rains now. It is there's like an atmosphere, and it's. I don't know. It's crazy. But the Astrodome, that brings up some good memories to a Houstonian like myself. I love it. So anyways, away from my Falcons. Don't want to talk about them anymore. I'm over it. <laughs> week two, though, basically in a nutshell, 2020 in a nutshell, right? Week two. Uh, we had a ton of huge, huge injuries, as I mentioned earlier, to not just anybody, but really, really good players. Um, we lost Nick Bosa, uh, Saquon Barkley, Cortland Sutton. All of them gone for the season with ACL injuries. Not to mention the 
the only guy that seems to carry his team more than anyone else, Christian McCaffrey, this is going to kill fantasy owners everywhere, losing him for, I think, four to six weeks is what they said. Jimmy Garoppolo, Drew Locke, Tavon Young, Malik Hooker, Jeff, how does that happen? How does this happen all at once? Is this because of no preseason? The the thing that everybody says that they've been wanting to get rid of? Does this show you how important the preseason is? Or is it something else? Well, I think it shows you a couple of things. Number one, that the only thing that gets you in shape is playing football. Football gets you in football shape. Nothing else does. No personal trainers. No, you know, and, and it's changed so much. And, and this is, again, one of the conversations June and I had. He said when he was a... When he was a quarterback in Atlanta, they would go to training camp July 2nd, and they wouldn't get out of training camp till the first week in September. So it was a long, long time, and but it was a gradual buildup over that time so that your body, by the time you got to September, you're battle-tested. Now, what happens, especially this year in COVID-19, these kids went to camp, and three, three weeks later, they're playing a game. And your body just is not ready for you know, the violence of the game, the, the stress that's put on it. And, and then I think the one, two, Rachel, and I've tweeted this out this week. I think the NFL Players Association and the league have got to look at all of these Achilles tendon injuries because that was an injury that back in the day we never had. I mean, you never saw guys get an Achilles tendon. Really? It was like a rare, rare freak injury. Now guys are popping Achilles left and right, and, and uh, there's got to be a reason for it. I don't know if it's the turf. I don't know if it's, you know, what's go you know what's going on in practice whatever but the league's got to come they got to find it out because we understand the knee and like Vince Lombardi said the knee always the knee but Achilles tendon injuries you know th those are sometimes season enders for sure and sometimes career yeah. enders and, and we got to get a handle on it yeah and Achilles injury is no joke um a lot of people have to learn how to walk again after that happens. I mean, that's a huge injury. One time, just a little side story, I was sitting courtside at a, uh, it was, a, I think, a high school playoff game. And uh, my friend was refereeing the game, so I got to sit really close. And this kid grabs the ball, and he rebounds the ball, and then he just steps back on his foot to go to the other end of the court. And you hear a pop, and the kid falls to the ground, and you can literally see it almost like coil up his the back of his leg. It's horrible, gruesome injury that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. But, um, okay, so let's go over our week two picks before we start talking about our week three picks. Uh, we were both right about the Rams. They completely destroyed the Eagles. Uh, a lot of people seem to look good against the Eagles this year. Uh, you were right about the Seahawks over the Patriots. And we landed our very first picks-wise parlay with the Ravens. They were favored by seven, and then we coupled that with the Browns and the Steelers money line. So go us. We are making the people some money. I love it. Let's bless the masses with some more money in week three. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Let's roll. All right, leg out. So to start it off, we're going to take it all the way down to Florida, where great things and a lot of bad things seem to happen all the time. Uh, it's Thursday night football. We have the Dolphins, and they're going to head up to Duval. For those of you that don't know, that's Jacksonville's rallying cry. That's the county in which they reside. Uh, they're going to take on Gardner Minshew and the Jags. Uh, real quick, do you say Jaguar, or do you say Jaguar, or do you say Jaguar? Jaguar, I say, but back in the, back in the UK, it's Jaguar. So It's Jaguar. No, I yeah, I guess we're, whatever flavor is all right with me. They are, they should nickname this game the Beard Bowl because we're going to get yes. some quarterbacks with some interesting facial hair in this one, if nothing else. Yeah, I give it to uh, Minshew. At least his facial hair is, it looks tailored. It looks like there is some effort there. Whereas Ryan Fitzpatrick, he just, he looks like a homeless guy. And it's funny you mentioned that <laughs> because... All week, they've actually been going back and forth in the media with each other, kind of taking jabs at each other's beards. It's good stuff. You should look that up on Twitter if you haven't already seen it. So the Jaguars, they opened up the, early on this week. Uh, they were one-point favorites. But they're now three-point favorites. And the point total is set at 47 and a half. All right, Minshew Mania, which I am afflicted with, it is going strong. I don't know how he's doing it, but he's doing it. Um, somehow, he's looked to be a very capable and viable Fantasy quarterback this season, he's logged 339 yards and two touchdowns in the last game versus Tennessee. So uh, he takes his team up to Tennessee. 
people thought they'd get blown out. The line ended up at eight and a half, and they kept up with them. And they had a final drive that could have won them the game. But what do you know? Tennessee's defense decides to show up. And um, Tennessee ends up winning that game. But as I said in our last show, I told you guys the Jaguars weren't going out eight and a half points. And they ended up covering. So good for them. Now, the Dolphins, uh, they show a lot of promise despite losing to the Bills. Fitz Magic, if you've watched him over the, over the past, you know that he loves tight ends. And Mike Gesicki, it looks like one of his new favorite targets down there. Um, he had 130 yards and a touchdown. And I left him sitting on my fantasy football bench. Ugh, what was I thinking? Uh, Jeff, look, it's not it's not Hollywood. It's not what most people consider prime time. It's not one of the greatest Thursday night football game matchups we could think of. But uh, what do you think about this game? How do you see it going? I think it's going to be a hell of a game. And, I, and I'll tell you why. Because you got two quarterbacks with – different physical attributes, but basically the same competitive nature, the same riverboat gambler style, because, you know, Fitz is going to make some unbelievable throws and he's going to throw some to the other team. And Minshew's the same way. He's a streak shooter. He's like a basketball player that, you know, when he gets hot, you, you better get the ball away from him because when he's hot, he's dangerous. So, you know, I think that the, these teams are really, really evenly matched. This is a game that, that, if, if you ask me, Rachel, I would make it a money line pick, not a, not a uh, spread pick, because I think the game is so close, and I think that's reflected in, in, the, uh, in the spread. You know, last week we said we had a, real, a bunch of gnarly spreads, and it, it really worked out. It was exactly that way. But I, I, think, uh, I think the Jags will win it at home um, because they're able to score points. That's the thing that you look at them and you just say – you know, they've lost, they've lost two football games, but they've been able to score points. And, and uh, you know, Miami's 30th in the NFL right now in defense. And so they've given up yards and, you know, in chunks. Mm -hmm. But you look at that and you say, well, they played the Patriots and they played the Bills. I, I think this is going to be a really good football game to watch. And I think it's going to be a close game. But I really think the Jaguars will win it. Yeah, I think it's going to be a lot more fun than people think as well. So I'm glad that we agree on that. So what do you think about, well, I think I know what you're going to say, but what do you think about the 47 and a half point total? What do you, what do you think about that? Too high, too low? Well, you know, you, again, you look at these two defenses and one is 30th in the league and one's 23rd in the league. And that would tell you that you're going to, you're, there's going to be points scored because the offenses have got weapons. There's some guys out there, you know, some of them aren't big names yet around the league because they're young mm -hmm. players. Gasecki's catch, when he was running that crossing route and he reached up and backhanded, one-handed backhanded that ball. Oh, like, no. that, was, that was a sick, sick catch that he made. And that kid's a great athlete for a, for a six, six guy. And, you know, was a high school All-American basketball player. I don't know who Jacksonville's going to have match up with him. Then you look at the other side, of, and, you know, Minshew, he just runs around and does crazy things with the ball. So I think it's going to be a great game. I, I, I wouldn't, again, I think, the, I think the spread is probably pretty close. And, I, and I would, if I was betting this game, I would make it a money line pick. I wouldn't touch the over or the under. I would strictly stay money line on this. Yeah, and I, I wish I – And by the way, I got to tell you, I was 15-1 and one on my money line picks last week. But the freaking Saints killed me in the in the, in the game the other night. So yeah. but, uh, so I, I like this one is too close to call, I think, other than you know, make it a money line pick. Yeah, and you know, it kind of is because the spread is only three, right? The Jaguars, they're favored by three. Um I I wish I disagreed with you for the sake of banter, but I don't. I was thinking before we came on today, I'm like this is a game that I would not normally want to touch at all. I wouldn't want to touch it. Um, the, I, I definitely think the Jaguars are going to win it. So I'm going to go with you on that on the money line. Uh, and, you know, if they're going to win it, then you may as well take the spread, I guess. Three. Vegas gives the home team three. They happen to be the home team. So there you go. Uh, so just, just to overall summarize it up again, Jeff and I both – we don't really want to touch the spread at all. We're just going to say go money line on this one, Jaguars. And uh, 47 and a half, you have two teams that don't have defense and quarterbacks that can sling the ball around. So you're taking the over, Jeff? Uh, I'll take the over. 
All right, I'll take the over as well. Pick, I take the over. You got to make a pick. You got to make a pick. We'll take the over. All right. All right. Uh, guys, look, this isn't just about us. Full disclosure, we want to hear from you as well. So be sure to leave some comments down below, and uh, we'll try to get back to you and give, give you our thoughts. All right, Jeff. Now we're going to move to Sunday's slate of games. Uh, we have an outstanding lineup, and I, for one, am very excited to watch them. Uh, first, we're going to focus on the Rams. They are traveling way up north to Buffalo to take on the Bills. Uh, now, the two teams are both sitting at 2-0, and so pretty impressive. I, I didn't expect that. Uh, now, this week, the Bills opened up as the favorites. They were favored by three, but now, now it's bumped back down a little bit. Now they're only favored by a point and a half, and the over-under point total is set at 47 and a half once again. Uh, the Rams... They looked really good against Philly last week, 37-19 win. Uh, but then again, who hasn't looked good against Philly's defense, at least? Uh, you and I saw that one coming from a mile away. Uh, Jared Goff, he's had an extremely productive game. He's had a productive season thus far. 267 yards last week and three touchdowns. Um, he seems to have finally eliminated turnovers from, from his game and is being assisted a lot by, by a solid run game down there. Uh, the Bills, they were expected to beat the Dolphins, and they did. They beat them 31 to 28. Josh Allen had 417 yards, four touchdowns, and a ton of rushing yards. Okay. Don't let the paint job fool you. That kid can run. Okay. <laughs> Jeff, these two quarterbacks performing very well, as we just said. Two teams that are performing really well. They could probably go pretty deep. Uh, are we rolling with the Rams this week, or the Bills? Are they going to get this one too? No, I'm going to take the Bills, and I'm going to tell you why I'm going to take the Bills. Number one, you, you hit on Josh Allen. Josh Allen is leading the National Football League right now in passing, and that's unbelievable. As a college player, as a high school player, as a junior college player, he never one time completed 60% of his passes. He's completing 70% of his passes now. Stephon Diggs has been a godsend in Buffalo. He gives them a vertical threat. Cole Beasley's a great inside guy. They've got three with, with uh, Brown. They've got three really good receivers. They haven't even got the running game going yet in Buffalo. Uh, you know, they're 22nd in the league right now rushing. When that gets going, when Singletary gets on track, they're going to be nasty because they play great defense. And, uh, you know, I think that you look at the Rams, uh, Woods is obviously the, their number one guy. He's their wide receiver one. But I think Tyler Higby's a key to this one for them. Buffalo's had trouble with health at the linebacker positions. They, they won last week without their starting inside linebackers, two of them, Milano. They were both out. And so I think that Buffalo's a little healthier. And again, the Rams have to make the toughest commute that you have to make in the NFL, and that's from east to west. And they're going to have to do it two weeks in a row. They were in Philadelphia last week. They went back, flew all the way back across the country to L.A. Now they've got to fly up to Buffalo. It'll be cool in the, in Buffalo, and I just think, even though I'm a big Sean McVay fan, I think that this is a tall ask. I like that spread for Buffalo, so I'm going to take Buffalo. I Okay, I like that you're taking Buffalo. I'm taking the Rams. Um, look, I will, I, I'm woman enough to admit whenever I'm wrong about somebody, and I was, I was wrong about Josh Allen. And yes, the two teams that he has played this season, probably not the best defensive teams, that you're going to play, but he's so versatile. As we said last year, was it last year? He was first or second out of all quarterbacks rushing the ball. And, and the one thing we knew about him coming out of college, because I don't think a lot of people watched him in college, he played at a very small school, but he had a big arm. That's what everybody kept saying, big arm. And man, last week, he really showed that off. I think he completed five or maybe it was more passes of over 20 yards. And having Stefan Diggs, you know, lining up in front of him is the sole reason for that. I mean, it opens up their game tremendously. And you're right about Devin Singletary. He hasn't been running the ball a lot. They have been using him in the passing game. I know I have him in fantasy football. Then you talk about the Rams. And the reason I'm picking the Rams is because they just look like they're almost back to the same form that they were, what was it, 2017, whenever they made their Super Bowl run. I trust Sean McVay. He's a great, great offensive mind. Um, they seem to be able to run the ball with whoever they put back there. And Cooper Cup, Tyler Higby, and 
Robert Woods, like you said, but I love Cooper Cup and the versatility that he adds. Higby has been tremendous. I'm just going with the team that's gone a little bit further historically and I just think has the mindset to do it. Otherwise, I'd pick the Bills. This is going to be a great game regardless. It's basically a pick em. So you're choosing the Bills who are favored at a point and a half, right? Yeah, I am. And, I, and again, I go back to what you said about Josh Allen. You know, he, he had, it was never known as an accurate deep ball thrower. He's got a huge arm. He's got one of the bigger arms in the National Football League. But this year, at this point in the season, he leads the NFL in completions over 20 yards. And that's the Stephon Diggs effect that we've seen. So I, I just think that this, this at home, this Buffalo team plays such great defense. Um, they play great special teams. The Rams are very, very talented. But I think, if, you know, it's almost a pick em game when you look at that spread. So I'm going to take the home team because, you know, as we said, when I first went to the Kansas City Chiefs in 2020, or, or two, excuse me, 2000, Coach Vermeil said three points in every NFL game to the whole home team before you even talk about anything else. So I'll give the Bills the, the nod there. All right, I like that. Now, talking about the, the point total set at 47 and a half, okay? These are two defenses that can get after it. But I think most people probably, I'm going to give the edge probably defensively to the Bills. Uh, they have my guy from my alma mater, Ed Oliver, just riding his horses around town, Buffalo. I love that guy. He's awesome. Uh, but they, the Bills, fantastic defense, great secondary. But then you look at the Rams, and who do they have? They have Aaron Donald. And the dudes around them, they're not scrubs either. So I, I mention all that to, to kind of bring it back home to the point total set at 47 and a half. Is that too high? Well, you, you're going to look at this game, and you're going to say that you're going to have to score – at least three touchdowns to win the game and probably four. So that's 28 right there. And we figure it's going to be a close game. So if you just go use the math that way, that it's going to take 28 to win it and it's going to be a close game, then that tells you it would be over 47. All right. So Jeff is going to go with the Bills to cover uh, their favorite uh, one and a half points. I'm going with the Rams. This is basically a pick them. I'm going with the Rams. And Jeff is taking the over. I'm going with the under. Uh, I just think I think the two defenses are going to do their job, and I think this is a big game for them because it's it's for it's one of the better teams that the Bills have played. So I I don't know. I'm just I feel it. My woman's intuition in my gut. I'm taking the under. There you have it. Rams Bills. I can't wait to uh, get back next week with you on this one and see who won. I want to see if I can beat a coach. Can Rachel, I beat a coach? Rachel, Rachel, I will never argue with a woman's intuition. I, I found out in my life that there's no future in that. So. <laughs> yes, that's right. You're a good man, and that will get you very far in life. Uh, guys, again, we want to hear from you. Be sure to comment down below on the Rams and the Bills. What do you think about our picks and our reasoning? Let us know, and uh, I'll let you know if you're completely wrong and I'm completely right. So that's probably what it is. All right, on to the next one. All right, now the second game we are going to focus on today is going to be the Cowboys, who are headed to Seattle to take on the Seahawks, of course. Uh, Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson, by all means, this 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 will probably be a pretty good game. It usually is. Now, initially the line was uh, favoring Seattle two and a half points. It has then since doubled. Seattle are now five-point favorites, and the point total is set at 55 and a half points. Pretty sure that that is the highest point total of the week. That's That probably has a lot to do with the Cowboys last week coming back on my Falcons, who blew a 20-point lead. Uh, so that, you know, they showed, they showed, Dak Prescott did something that I didn't think he could do. And, of course, it was against Atlanta's defense, but he led a team back from a huge deficit. I've always thought that he was just kind of the dude, game manager, plays well with a lead, but if, if you're down 14 points in the fourth quarter, can he bring you back? And he he silenced the haters like myself on that and showed probably why he's going to end up getting paid. Um, so, like we said, Dak found his mojo. They somehow won 40-39. to 39. I'm going to have nightmares about this forever. Now, the Seahawks, <laughs> they also had a really, really good game. That was a really fun game to watch. Um, I didn't get to watch it because I had drank myself to sleep after the Falcons game. But I went back and I watched about 15 minutes, highlights. That was, that was a really fun game to watch. Really fun. Um, 
They beat a good New England team and big, big, big goal line defense right at the very end. Typical Pete Carroll game, right? Tough defense. Nice 35-30 win. Now, Jeff, do you think the Cowboys are going to gain – did they gain a ton of confidence from beating my my Falcons? Or and is that enough to help them beat Russell Wilson and cover the spread? Well, I think the, the thing with the Cowboys is and, – and you hit on something that I think we need to talk about – Dak Prescott is maybe the most underrated quarterback in the National Football League because right now, if you look at the stat sheet, he's sitting third in the league in, in passing. You know, as, And I tell you what, he's 68% completions, hasn't thrown an interception, takes care of the football. But for some reason, he never gets the love that I think he deserves from people who watch the game. And, you know, I don't know what that where that comes from, but you're exactly right. I would love to be Dak's agent because, uh, I mean, I... He's going to get a boatload of money based upon what Deshaun and Patrick Mahomes got. As far as the Cowboys, I think, Rachel, the one thing that that game will give you is some belief that you can come back from any kind of deficit. Because Mm -hmm. at the end of the first quarter, I'm watching the game, and the Cowboys had fumbled it about four times in the first quarter. They looked awful. I mean, awful. And Atlanta went through them. You know, it wasn't even – it was like it was watching a high school team play a junior high team. And – I looked at that and I said, there's no way they're going to get blown out at home. And then they just kept chipping away, kept coming back and coming back. And then Atlanta made a couple mistakes and they won the football game. And Dak was a big part of that coming off of the injury table to go back in the second half and win the game. So big props to them, to their offense. But still, they are horrendous on defense. And and Atlanta is in that same category. So I don't know. I don't know if that, you know, you get 55 and you go, my God, 55 as an over-under. I mean, that's like prohibitive over-and-under. But with these two defenses, you know, nothing's impossible. So I, I, I'm going to take, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I, you look at this one and I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to sit back just on my chair right here. And I'm going to let you take this one first and tell me how you see it. All right. I'll tell you how I see it. I see this game going, I think, you know what, what were we saying week one? Maybe it was week one or week two. What are they doing down there and up there in Seattle? They are letting Russ cook, okay? And I think this is going to be the the first, uh, I think he's been in the league for eight years. They keep on doing what they're doing right now with him and letting him sling it out and just turning him loose. I do think that Russell Wilson, this is going to be an MVP year for him. Um, I think he's going to take full advantage of Dallas's weaknesses in defense. And don't get me wrong, the Seahawks, they have weaknesses defensively as well. It's kind of bizarre to say this, but they, you know, a team that wasn't really generating any kind of pass rush, well, they went and addressed that with a defensive back in Jamal Adams. And, I mean, that dude, he can blitz. He can get – he can – he can rush the quarterback and they have some injuries now to their offensive line. The Dallas Cowboys do, uh, man, it, it's going to be a fun game to watch. I think 55 and a half point total is a little high. Um, but then again, you know, the Cowboys, they really impressed me as well. Dak is making receivers out of people that we didn't even know existed. Like they lost Blake Jarwin, right? They, and so you're thinking the Cowboys don't have a tight end. Then Dalton, Dalton Schultz shows up, like, who the hell's this guy? And he gets, like, I think almost 90 yards in a touchdown. Like, Dak is playing great. And I'm sure he's riding high, you know, after the game, he's wearing that cowboy hat. He's standing up at the, at the podium, cowboy hat, and is like, Stetson. And he's just looking like he owns the state of Texas, and he does. Um, it's definitely not, not the Texan state. Uh, I, oh, man, I don't know. This is a tough game, guys. Really, really tough game. I'm going to take the Seahawks. I, I believe that they cover five because I just believe in Russell Wilson and Pete Carroll. And I believe that they, all the weaknesses that they have defensively, Pete Carroll will coach and scheme whatever he needs to do to make sure that his defense does what they need to do. I think that the Seahawks still pull off a healthy win. I do, but, but 55 and a half over under is a little high for me. So in conclusion, you taking the Seahawks minus five, or are you just staying away from it completely? You want money line? No, I, I, I take the Seahawks. And I would, if, if you could have locked it in at three, I'd have jumped on it real fast. Yeah. But, you know, it makes you think about it at five, but I still like the Seahawks. It's at home. Um, you know, I, I agree with you. You know, the Seahawks defense, remember now, 
first their, their starting safety got kicked out of the game. He got ejected for an illegal hit. The backup safety went down in the game. So they're down to nobody in the back end. And that's one of the reasons why they gave up some of the yards that they gave up. But I, I really think that they'll find a way to get enough stops in this game to win the game because I just don't know how Dallas is going to find them on defense. And, uh, you know, I think it's kind of a it's a wash in the kicking game. So I'm going to take the Seahawks at home by five. All right. See, and then the over-under. I ain't touching that one. I you ain't touching it. I, I wouldn't touch it. No way. That is nasty, nasty, nasty. 55, you got it. I mean, that's just crazy. I mean, could happen? Sure, yeah. could happen. But, you know, again, it's all about playing odds. And the odds of team scoring 55 points in an NFL game, that, that's not great. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Um, if it happened, I would not be surprised. And if it doesn't happen, and this is a game that stays probably hovers around 47, 48 points, I wouldn't be surprised at that either. Uh, but one thing's for sure, Russell Wilson is going to cook. So look for any good prop bets about that. Um, we're both, though, we'd advise to stay away from the, the point total on this one. All right, guys, on to the next game. All right, Jeff, Sunday night football, prime time. The Packers are going to New Orleans to take on the Saints. Uh, Rodgers versus Breeze. I hope. This is a really, really good matchup. I hope Breeze doesn't look like how he looked against the Raiders, like it was just really hard to throw a pass. But regardless, these two guys, they're going to show up, especially for this matchup. All right, so let me introduce the line. Initially, it opened up the Saints were a six-point favorite. But now it's they're only half that. They're only getting a field goal with a three-point advantage at home over the Packers. Now, the over-under point total is set at 51-and-a-half. Now, the Packers, they strolled to a comfortable win over the Lions despite, despite some early pressure. Uh, that was a good game early on, and then it ended very lopsided. Aaron Jones, he had three touchdowns, 236 yards combined. The Saints are going to have to find a way to stop him in order to win this game. Now, the Saints, they lost to the Raiders Monday night, 34-24. to Neither of us saw that coming. I don't think anyone saw that coming. They just couldn't get much going, particularly with Emmanuel Sanders. He only got 18 yards. Now, they're going to have to get more out of him this week without Michael Thomas. Like, he's really got to step up for them. Uh, But like I said, no Michael Thomas. Again, for Drew Brees, Packers looking hot. Saints on a shorter week. And they're losing. This is kind of set up for Green Bay to win. Or do you think the Saints bounce back? I'm going to take the Packers. Uh, I I tell you what, you know, we're looking at a Saints offense that really has struggled in two weeks. It's not the Saints offense that we've seen before. Breeze has very, very difficult time getting the ball down the field. And one thing you know about pro football is if you don't do something well, teams are going to attack that every week. And you're going to get all kind of, I, I'm sure that Mike Pettin is going to play all kind of saturation coverage where they've got five guys spread across the field short. They'll play, you know, two man. They'll play a bunch of rat, what we call rat coverage, things that you do against a quarterback who's not going to, not going to run the football on you. So I think it's going to be really difficult for the Saints to move the ball. It's just, as you mentioned, a short week. The Packers are hot. Uh, you know, Aaron Jones is a, he's a man now. And you know, we say that they only have uh, Devontae Adams as a threat on, on as a wide receiver, but. Some of those lesser-known receivers, are, they're doing enough, you know, to make plays. And Aaron, Aaron Rodgers elevates the play of everybody around him. I just think, you know, you look at Packers are first on offense in the National Football League, 10th on defense, 5th in passing, 1st in rushing. They're doing a lot of things really, really well. And now, again, got to couch that with the fact that that's against the Vikings and against the Lions. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, the Saints have played – played the Bucks and and uh, and the Raiders. That's those, you know, that's not murderer's row either. So I really think that the Packers will win this football game. I would have loved that five point spread. I mean that would have been a great I'd have jumped all over that at five. But even at three, I think it's it's uh, it's a Packer it's a Packer pick. Yeah, I don't disagree with you here. If you would have asked me week one, I'd probably have a completely different answer to this. True. But after watching Drew Monday night football it looked like it pained him to throw the ball 10 yards. I mean, it looked like he was just putting everything in his in his little body just to get it 10 yards on the field. And 
Aaron Rodgers is looking fantastic. I have him in fantasy football in one league. I have Drew in another, actually. But, no, Aaron's playing great. He's playing at probably – I think whenever it's all said and done, he'll be in the MVP discussion if he keeps going like he is. And they just have – more threats, it seems, offensively. Aaron Rodgers, you know he's going to sling it around to anybody and everybody, right? You usually hate getting Packers receivers in fantasy football just because they're just not consistent because Aaron, can he just throws it around to everybody. And defensively, I watched the Saints give up so much to Darren Waller. Like, he was just having a field, and it wasn't even, like, deep yardage throws. It was just little, cutting him up down the middle. So... I don't think that the Saints have enough defensively to stop the Packers, and I just cannot see Drew Brees right now outplaying Aaron Rodgers. So it's just that simple to me, just the eyeball test. I'm going to take the Packers to cover three, obviously, because I'm taking the money line to win it all. Now, the over-under, the point total, 51 and a half. What do you think about that? I think that's a little strong, to be honest with you. I would take mm-hmm. if, you, if you said take the over under, I'd take the under there because again, you're talking about now one team's got to score 30 and, and the other team's got to score three touchdowns to get the over. So uh, I, I just don't know if the Saints right now they they are struggling. They they're not running the ball very well, and and we talked about the, the challenges in the passing game, the vertical passing game. So uh, I, I if I had to pick that one, I would take the under. Yeah, I'm going to take the under as well for exactly the same reason as you. Uh, the Packers, they're not, they're pretty good at stopping the run. And it's going to be on Alvin Kamara, I think, to, to, to win this game for the Saints. So I'm taking the under as well. So we're both taking the Packers money line. So obviously they're going to cover the three point spread and 51 and a half. Guys, don't forget, put your comments down below. Okay, Jeff, I've been really excited to talk about this matchup right here. This is going to be the highlight of the week, and it happens on Monday night football. I think it's going to be one of the best regular season matchups we have seen since probably the last time these two teams matched up against each other. We have the Chiefs and the Ravens, and this game's going to be in Baltimore. Now, the Ravens are three-point favorites here. Uh, Actually, it's moved one point over from week two with the over-under point total at a very juicy 53.5 points. Okay, so the Ravens they're 2 and 0 with ease. They beat the Houston, they beat the brakes off the Houston Texans 33 to 16 in Houston, which means both sides have dismissed. God, talk about a ter- like a horrible starting uh schedule for the Texans, right? For week 1 they have to face the Chiefs, then they go to uh play the Ravens. Now this week they're going to play the Steelers. That's brutal for for them. I mean, ugh, how how quick can they get Bill O'Brien out of town, you think? Um as for the Chiefs, okay. So they needed overtime to beat the Chargers. Harrison Butker, that is a man's man right there, okay? This this kicker is getting some some notoriety. He kicked the winning field goal in a 23-20 to overtime win. Jeff, this could be the game of 2020. Lamar versus Mahomes. I can't wait. How do you see this one going? I think it's one of the most evenly matched games in in the that we'll see all year and i think this could be a super bowl preview uh you know i i i I really think when you watch this and i talk about super bowl preview i'm talking about that for the afc championship right because baltimore you look at them and they're 12th in offense they're you know they're second on defense uh, surprisingly 24th in passing because i thought lamar's really taking a step with his ability to throw the ball but they're fourth in the ability to run Flip it over and you look at Kansas City and strikingly, Kansas City is 18th in the NFL in passing. Now you think about Patrick Mahomes, you say no way they're 18th in the NFL in passing and they're eighth in rushing. And, you know, right now they're 27th in defense. Now that's against the Texans, right? And the Texans were, you know, didn't have a bunch of healthy receivers in that first game. And against a rookie quarterback who found out he was going to play 10 minutes before the game started. So it wasn't exactly like he, I'm sure he was prepared, but it wasn't exactly like he, you know, anticipated that this was going to happen. And he went out there and, you know, they went to overtime. So I think when you factor all those things in, it's in Baltimore, it's on grass. Uh, Those are advantages to Baltimore. I I think that Baltimore will win this football game. And um, that 
over and under. Now, again, what would you do if you're coaching? What would you do if you knew that the other team had all the explosive weapons that Kansas City had? How would you, and you've got a great running game. Are you going to run it every down and, and use, use the clock and keep him on the sideline? Of course you are. So yeah. I think that's what you're going to see. I think Greg Roman's going to have a few wrinkles for Steve Spagnuolo. And I think that they will run it. And I think they'll get off the bus running is exactly what I think. Mm -hmm. And they'll run and, and run and run and run. You know, we saw, I think, the emergence of a really fine rookie running back in Baltimore last week with J.K. Dobbins. And all that does is give them more depth at running back. And, and it's not like they're without running back talent in that, in that running back room. Yeah, even their, even their quarterback can basically play running back in Lamar Jackson. Uh, here, here's what I witnessed last week with the Texans versus the Ravens, Jeff. Um, I saw the Texans, who are a team with an old aging J.J. Watt. They no longer have Jadavian Clowney. They have really overpaid guys like Whitney Merciless, who's non-existent right now for them, and Zach Cunningham. And I saw that pass rush which my point here is that they don't really have a pass rush. And I watched them sack Lamar Jackson multiple times. Um, now, of course, the Ravens still won the game, right? But I, I worry a little bit because I know that right now, Greg Roman and Lamar Jackson, they seem to be trying to keep him in the pocket. I'm assuming the goal here is to get him hit less, right? Keep him healthy, uh, extend his career, keep him healthy in the playoffs. Uh, but th that that bothers me. And I know that the Chiefs, can get to the quarterback rushing four. I've seen it before. So mm -hmm. that that worries me in this game. And, and look here, Lamar Jackson, by all means, MVP caliber talent. When he's playing with a lead, okay, he is first, uh, like number one ranking uh, a passer rating. When he's playing from behind, 23rd. Okay, 23rd. And he usually seems to get uh, these, these late game turnovers and stuff. It, it, I don't know. I, I don't like the Ravens in this game. I'm going to go with the Chiefs. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, as a starter, has never lost to the Ravens. Okay, he's 2-0 and against them. Uh, and how fun is this? It's not very often that we see the Chiefs as an underdog, but they are. I, I hopped in on this one early on in the week. Uh, I made a parlay, a parlay uh, definitely with the Chiefs taking the money line and them to cover. Uh, but, yeah, I just I don't know why. I don't know why I'm just filling the Chiefs in this game. I think the Chiefs will get up for this game. D do you believe in a Super Bowl hangover? Is that real? Well, I don't. I don't really believe. I, yeah, if you say look at the stats, look at the look, you know, look at the history, you'd say yeah, there there is such a thing. I think you know if you talk to coaches that have won the Super Bowl, they will tell you that the hardest year in coaching is the year after the Super Bowl because. Usually what happens is everybody wants to take a bow. Everybody wants to get paid. Everybody wants to you know, do the next talk show and get the next commercial. Mm -hmm. The Chiefs, I think the Chiefs have kind of insulated themselves from that. You know, they paid Mahomes. They paid, you know, they've gone out and paid guys to keep continuity in their organization. You made a really good point, Rachel, about nobody. Now, this is, this is shocking to me when I did my research. Nobody in the National Football League has been sacked more than Lamar Jackson has after two games. I, I, and, you know, I thought it would be Joe Burrow by, by landslide, yeah, but, but it's, sure. actually, it's actually Lamar. So I think that when they're having their coaching meetings this week, that Harbaugh is going to sit down with the offensive coaches and say, listen, we can't expose Lamar to hits, right? We've got to run the ball. We've got to get ahead of the, on the chains. We've got to win on first down and, you know, bleed the clock and use play clock and do what we do, get back to doing what we do, because I think they've, they've, in an effort to show that he can throw better, they've exposed him to two, you know, they're not a great pass blocking offensive line. Hard to do both, be great, you know, because the Chiefs right. aren't a great run blocking offensive line. They just kind of get in your way, but they're great pass protectors because that's what they do. It's just the converse is true in Baltimore. Yeah, I I just, I yeah, like I said, I'm going with the Chiefs on this one. Um, I think that for both teams, the key here is to run the ball. I think that'll probably be at least early on until they have to make adjustments, whoever has the lead. Uh, run the ball, right? You want to keep the ball out of each quarterback's hands, more so than ever with this matchup right here. You want to run the ball to eliminate turnovers and eat up the clock. So definitely, if there's some prop bets out there for the running backs, 
Uh, go with your gut on that one. Could could be could be some good money to win right there. Now the over under point total is set at fifty three and a half. Not the nope. highest, not nope. the highest one of the week. Believe it or not. So nope, I you're saying it. under? Oh, you're, saying, you're not touch- touching it. I ain't touching that one because I really think that um, you know. Again, if you said take one, right? It, it can't, you can't you can't draw. I, I'd say take the under because in big football games, mm-hmm. typically. You know, you play a little bit close to the vest now you, and you play a little more conservative because you don't want to blow the game on a, you know, like say, for example, like last year, the Texans in the playoffs against Kansas City, they took some chances in their kicking game that really hurt them on that fake punt in the in the first quarter. And it got momentum back for Kansas City. Typically, you don't do that in big games. And I think Harbaugh coached this game close to the vest and, and keep the score down. OK, so you're taking the under. I would take the under. Yeah. I'm going to ride the wild side on this one, okay? <laughs> I like the rush, okay? I'm going to take the over. I just think, I think, like I said early on, I think it's going to be run the ball, run the ball, right? And then both teams are going to have to adjust. And next thing you know, we could have a shootout. And I'm, I want that. That'll be so much fun. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to take the over in this one. But we're both going with the Chiefs. Nope. Or, oh, no, no, nope. you're taking the Ravens. Don't you think of me to try and take my – I'm taking okay. my Ravens here. I, I like Lamar. I think it's Lamar's time. And, and uh, I, again, I, you look at them, they're so balanced. They're such a good football team on both sides of the ball. Both, I know both teams play great special teams, and, and both have great kickers. So it, nice. it's going to be a heck of a game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Um, does Lamar win a playoff game this year? Is this the year he finally wins a playoff game? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, you look at him and he looks so much better in the pocket. The ball comes out of his hands so much better. He has so much better composure. They've got weapons. They, you know, Baltimore yeah. doesn't get, their receivers don't get the credit that they deserve. And, you know, Andrews as a tight end is an outstanding tight end. So, you know, I think that he's primed and ready now in his third year in the league. And I think that the coaches will do a better job of helping him, you know, when he gets to playoff football. All right. Can't wait to see it, guys. Let us know what you think in the comments below. You got the purple or you got the Chiefs? Who is it? Let us know, and I will let you know what we think. All right, Jeff, moving on from individual games of this week three, we are going to build you guys our PixWise Parlay of the Week. And that's where I'm going to give you my favorite, and Jeff's going to give you two of his favorite games. And then what you should do is take our choices because we are football geniuses and go make yourself some money with them. Build a, build a nice little parlay, okay? All right, Jeff, I'm going to start us off with my pick of the week for this parlay is going to be the Seattle Seahawks, okay? You can shoot – they're they're favored by four and a half in this game versus the Dallas Cowboys, and you can go with that. I feel pretty confident with that as well, but I'm just talking straight up money line, Seahawks. Russell Wilson is going to cook, okay, and he ain't about to lose to the defense that just gave up 40 or 39 points to my Falcons, okay? It's just it's just not going to happen. Take, take the Seahawks. Trust in the Seahawks. Trust in Russell Wilson. He's going to be your MVP this season. Just do it. All right, Jeff, what do you got? Well, I, I agree with you because, you know, we our parlays are better than the parlays they had on Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, we yes. really, we, we got the parlay thing figured out. And I'm going to take the Steelers over the Texans. It's a four-point spread for the Steelers. I, I just think that, you know, they play such great defense. And, again, Deshaun Watson's getting hit way too often for that offensive line, all the money they put into that offensive line. T.J. Watts leading the league in sacks. I think, you know— it's a chance for little brother to show up big brother at home in, you know, down in Texas. Uh, I, I'm going to take the Bucks over the Broncos. I just don't, I think no Drew Locke, no Cortland Sutton, no chance in Denver. And I, I'm going to take the Bucks over Denver in mile high. So let me get this right, Jeff. You don't believe in Blake Bortles. For the Denver Broncos. You don't believe that he's going to lead them into victory. No. I will say unequivocally no. Okay. All right. I don't think too many people are going to disagree with you on that one. That's a great pick. And that is our PixWise Parlay of the Week. Okay, Jeff. This is a fun, fun part of our show. 
This is going to be the PixWise Dogs of the Week, also known in the betting community as the underdog, the team that has all the odds stacked against them. My selection last week was the Jaguars, and I didn't pick them to win the game, but I did tell you guys that they weren't going to lose by no seven points. I think at the time it was seven. It ended up moving to eight and a half. I told y'all they weren't going to lose by seven, and I was right, making you money all the time. Jeff, you feeling good about this section right here? I like it because you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hedge my bets. And You're going to hedge that's what, them. That's what all smart bettors do. And so I am going to take, because the Chiefs are underdogs, and you said, as you said, that's very, a very rare situation that the world champion would ever be an underdog. I'm going to take the Chiefs as my dog of the week. Okay. Chiefs are his dog of the week. Now, are you you're picking them to to cover or... Well, I, you know, that's, what is it, three? Uh, no, I'm going to take them. I'm just going to take them straight. I like them. I think, uh, again, I told you that I was going to hedge my bets here. Now I'm going to. I see that. You know. So you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong either way. Got it. I like it. I like it. All right. My dog of the week is going to be an all. I have a lot of people that follow me on social media that are Eagles fans. Y'all aren't going to like me for this one. But I'm sorry. Uh, your defense sucks. They suck, and Joey Burrow is here, and he's here to make a statement, and he is going to stomp all over your defense just like everyone else has this season. The Bengals are six-and-a-half-point dogs to the Eagles. That, that ain't happening. They may not win the game. I would still bet them money line to win the game, but no matter what, they ain't losing by six, okay? It just ain't happening. Joey Burrow going to get it done, and that is your PicksWise Dogs of the Week. And finally, it is time for our PicksWise Locks of the Week. Jeff, we're going to provide the people with our best bets for week three in the NFL. It doesn't have to be any of the games we discuss. It can be the games we discuss. Now, I landed my, my choice last week. I had the Bucks to cover. They were favored by nine and a half. I chose them. They won. You're welcome, people. Uh, Jeff had the Browns, and they missed out by a half a point. So we're one and one going into week three. Jeff, we'll start with you. Who is your lock of the week for week three? I'm going to take the Bucks as my lock of the week. I just think that uh, they showed so much more improvement this week offensively. The defense is nasty right now. You know, Jason Pierre-Paul and, and uh, Dominican Sue both have two multiple sacks, and that's not even their best pass rushers yet. So I'm going to, I like the Bucks going into mile high. Okay. I, I think that's a very, very safe bet. It's, it's, Always a good good choice to bet with Tom Brady, at least historically it has been. And as we mentioned earlier, they're down to Blake Bortles. So when when it when your team decides to start Blake Bortles, you know you're in a bad situation. Definitely I'm with you on that one. Jeff, I normally try to be a professional and I try to stay away from my Atlanta Falcons. But look, <laughs> the Bears are undefeated, right? They're 2-0, and and they're going to the Mercedes Dome in Atlanta, Georgia, to take on my Falcons. They, they are actually underdogs. They're undefeated, but they're underdogs to my team that has not won a game. And a lot of people would say, oh, my gosh, there's so much value in Mitchell Trubisky and the Bears. No, there isn't. Because if you watched any of the Bears wins this season, you'll know that they are flukes. OK, this is like the 27th ranked passing offense. It, they're just they're horrible. OK, they, they should be one and one. OK, if they're lucky, they should be one and one. Because if you watch week one versus the Lions, Matthew Stafford, he threw a dime to the rookie DeAndre Swift. DeAndre Swift literally caught the ball with like just a couple of seconds left to go in the game. That would have sealed up the win. But then what does he do? He did what rookies do. He dropped it. The Bears just left him wide open. Like, no, they should have lost that game. The Lions should actually have a dub on, on their, on their uh, schedule so far, but they don't. No, 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 no. The Bears will not win. They will get exposed. It's a great week to start Mitchell Trubinsky in fantasy football. Don't get me wrong about that. Start any quarterback that's playing against the Falcons defense. But the Bears will not be able to keep up with Atlanta. So take them to cover. In fact, Buy extra points if you want. Atlanta's going to win this game by at least 10, okay? It's over for the Bears. Goodbye. Playoff hopes. Bye-bye. And ours begin. That's our locks of the week.
I tell you what, Rachel, those Falcons are so bad on defense, even their mama <laughs> wouldn't take them. So you're taking them. That's you are the all time Falcon fan. I'm speaking it into existence, okay? I'm speaking the W into existence. Falcons are going to win this game. The Bears are frauds. I'm sorry, Chicago. They're frauds. Oh, and our, also, uh, breaking news earlier today, uh, a Chicago great running back, Gail Sayers, has passed away. Um, rest in peace to him, for sure. Hey, from the, from the file of, you know football is a hard game. When you are a quarterback and you're getting a pain injection at, before the game so that you can play the game, and the doctor who administers the pain, inje- the pain injection punctures your lung, and then a rookie in his first game goes out and plays lights out and probably takes your job away, I think everybody needs to send condolences to Tyrod Taylor because yeah. that's exactly what happened to him this week. That's craziness. It's it's crazy. The game of football is crazy. Life is crazy. 2020 comes at you fast, man. That is some weird stuff. And do you think as a coach, you're more familiar with this world than we are. Uh, did that person who administered the shot to Tyrod Taylor, it, he lost his job? I don't know if he lost his job. And I'm, uh, you know, and again, there is some risk in, in that because injecting a broken rib or a cracked rib is really hard to do. But, you know, it's just it's hard to win football games no matter what, but then when you get, you know, when you're losing guys to injections before the game, it's really hard. And Tyrod Taylor, poor kid, you know, Baltimore gives up on him. He goes to Bill, the Bills. He's a starter with the Bills. They give up on him, goes to San Diego, gets his, or excuse me, Los Angeles, gets his opportunity. And then he <laughs> gets hurt in an injection, not in, the, yeah. not even in a game, in an injection. So again, I, my hat's, my hat and my heart are out, off to uh, Tyrod Taylor. For sure. And Justin Herbert, By all accounts, he looked good. So that ends the quarterback debate there. He's going to get the start this weekend. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to the PicksWise NFL show covering week three. We'll be back next week to preview week four and give you all the picks, make you all the money, and make sure that you thank us for making you all the money this week. All right, guys, (laughs) Jeff, thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you so much for your time. We're going to be a podcast, I heard. That's a, that's a oh, rumor yeah. floating around. We're going to be a podcast. How could I forget, guys? Uh, you're definitely always going to be right here on YouTube and the PicksWise uh, NFL show is always going to be filmed. But also, let's say you want to listen to us while you're driving in the car. Well, don't be watching the camera screen while you're driving, okay? Just turn on the podcast version, and uh, you're going to be able to find it on probably everywhere and anywhere that you would download your normal podcast at. So be sure to look us up and... Follow us, like, follow, share, subscribe, all that good stuff, guys. Jeff, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for mentioning that tidbit to me because I would have forgot it because I'm a terrible host. Uh, Best of luck with your bets, everybody. And remember, gamble responsibly. Aloha. Go Falcons. Adios. (laughs) 